Hello and welcome to the Luxury Living Podcast from Bravas. Uh, we're going to do something different this time, but as ever, if this is the first time you're coming to our podcast, or if you come back before another share or liked, please press those buttons, ring those bells and do's, all that sort of thing you can do to make sure that you don't miss out on our next podcast. Uh, with me as ever, I have uh, Keith. Hey, Keith, how are you? Doing great, Nigel. So, Keith, this time we're going to try something a bit different. We're going to do a sort of basic introduction to an area, like a 101. And uh, we pick lighting first. Why did we pick lighting? Why do you think that's a great place to start? Oh, gosh, that's a tough question. I, I think it's one of the most interesting things we cover. Um, and I think it's one thing that most people would need an introduction to. Um, most people probably have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to lighting. Okay, so. well, why don't you introduce, we have two other of the uh, Hit Elite Bravas team with us. So why don't you introduce the uh, other people on the meeting? Absolutely. So joining us, we have Kevin Roach, of Houston. Wave to us, Kevin. Good morning. And, and also joining us, we have TJ Goodwin, who is one of our top salespeople in Dallas. How's it going? And uh, both get, both guys have a ton of experience when it comes to lighting, um, lighting design, lighting control, uh, and just a lot of knowledge on the subject. Perfect. Okay, guys. Well, I'm going to start the conversation, and we're going to try and make this more of a conversation than an interview, but sometimes I move into interviewing, interviewer mode, so that's <laughs> I apologize if I do that ahead. But I do want to start at quite a high level with a very simple question. And, you know, as you think about this question, think about your experiences and tell us what you think. Um, there's a big difference between lighting design and lighting control or lighting and lighting control, isn't there? So I wonder, tell me a bit about your experience and Keith, we can start with you and how you view those things differently. Sure, they, uh, they dovetail very nicely together, but basically lighting design is uh, placing the fixtures where they go, um, creating the look of the space. And uh, that's typically done by a lighting designer or by the architect. And then lighting control is the actual physical controls that allow us to dim those lights, turn them off and on. And uh, the guys that have joined us are going to be able to say a lot more about it. That's kind of how we divide it. Control is the design of the lighting or sorry, design, lighting design, the design of the look of the lighting controls just how are we going to control that and make it easier for a client to experience? TJ, what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, to dovetail off of what Keith said, you know, we, we want to have the lighting design to, to make the light in the space really highlight the home um, and then the lighting control so we can recreate uh, those, you know, lighting scenes, if you will. So the spa space always looks like how the interior designer or architect um, or the lighting designer in, in this case, how they drew it up um, to highlight certain things, you know, paintings, uh, furnishings, etc. Yeah, DJ, I, I agree. You know, I think lighting design is really how do you accent the home to make it feel welcoming and lived in, highlighting a seating area or functional light for kitchen for cooking. Um, or even uh, decorative lighting on you know, beautiful chandeliers or pendants or sconces that go to the house. And so you've got the, um, the actual design or the locations of lights and the type of lights that go in uh, versus the control, which is how do we, how do we take a, an LED light and dim it? Or how do we um, make the house feel welcoming? Or how does it always feel safe when you come home or when you're going to bed at night, not having to run around the house to flip off all the switches to be able to do that easily from uh, the push of a button. And so... Uh, it's kind of how we look at it from a different standpoint versus the, the placement and location of lighting versus how do we interact with it and how do we use it and how does it complement our lifestyle. Yeah. Kevin, Kevin makes a really good point there because when we're talking about lighting design, it's not just putting four cans in a room and hoping it provides adequate light. It's task lighting, ambient lighting, and accent lighting and just combining all those together. So if you have a house that has to achieve those purposes, you might have five or six loads of lighting or five or six switches in a room. 
and being able to balance those so that that room looks beautiful every time is not most easily done with five or six different switches. It's one button that a client presses. And that's kind of where the lighting design and the lighting control overlap. It's like Kevin said, it's how do we make it look the same, make it look ideal every time, even though there's so many options. That's right. What, what, what is a lighting load? I, I hear that expression a lot. Not sure I know how to define it. Yeah, so a lighting load um, is, is typically a circuit of lights or a type of light that's connected together. And so um, say you take a kitchen, for example, we may have under cabinet lighting, which would be one load of lighting. You may have some recessed cans that go in the ceiling for general down lights or to light surfaces in the kitchen. That would be a second load of lighting. And then you may have some decorative pendants that are hanging in the room to, you know, make the room to add a little bit of design and style to the room. And so those pendants would be considered a load of lighting as well. And so it's how lights are broken apart from each other and how they are switched differently. And so that would be considered a lighting load. Therefore, a house should have lots of them. I mean, is, is it surprising to hear there's one, five, 50? How many loads might a house have? Yeah, it, it, literally hundreds. <laughs> and how do you talk to a homeowner about that and the design? TJ, how, how, when you're sitting down with a client, with a customer, how does that conversation go? Sure. I, I mean, I like to talk about layers of light, like Kevin was saying, right? So you have your, your task lighting, then your kind of decorative um, lighting, and they, they serve different purposes. Um, and then it ties in the lighting control depending on the activity um like if you're cooking you want quite a bit more light than if you're actually sitting down to eat dinner and you want to set mood lighting with your accent lights uh so in the case of you know cooking for staying in the kitchen you want to have your your down lights and and maybe the whole thing is lit up every load in the kitchen uh under cabinet over cabinet um so basically talking to the client about how they live in in, in specific spaces uh, and what their needs are can determine what kind of lighting you want to specify uh, for that space. Who should do the lighting design? A lighting designer. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah, that's a real right. career. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, there's certified lighting designers that we team up with at Bravis um, to make sure that you know what, what we're actually implementing in a client's home. You know, we can run photometrics, uh, which is a measurement of how much light is in each space in the in the house to show them on paper uh, what the house is essentially going to be doing. And, and you can do 3D renderings as well to really give the client a visual of what we're proposing uh, as far as light and how the coverage is uh, without actually having a structure to, to show it in. Yeah, and that, that's, right. that's actually an interesting point as well, because a lot of times when you get your plans for a house. I mean, most people, the houses they started in had a light in a room and then maybe they upgraded to a house with four lights in a room and they were recessed and that was pretty cool. But when you get a set of architectural plans, typically that's your uh, permit set. So that the architect has put lighting in the rooms to make sure that he can get um, permits signed off on so they can build the house. And a lot of times that's as far as the client's going to go with it and we can help them add to it and build a few more layers in. Um, but when somebody really is looking to make a space special and to make a space unique, that's when they really want to get a lighting designer involved. And, uh, and I just think most people have not experienced a place or a home with beautiful lighting design, but they've probably been to a really high end luxury hotel that had a beautiful lighting design and seen the difference between what a home typically looks like and what a really beautifully lit place can look like. I mean, Kevin, I think you've had the same experience. Uh, you've got homes that have the four fans, four cans and a fan, <laughs> four yeah. fans and a can would be pretty weird, but you have the four cans and a fan and then you have beautifully lit homes and the way they look and feel is vastly different. Yeah, it's dramatically different. That's absolutely right, Keith. So um, when, when we think about lighting and specifically design and placement of cans, Oftentimes, our reference point is the simple, as you mentioned, four cans in a room, right? You're lighting the floor, you're lighting the space. And our eyes don't actually perceive that as a well-lit space. 
we, we want to be able to see light on surfaces around us. And so if we can light walls or artwork on walls or furnishings in a room or a table, um, and we can look at those places, that makes it much more inviting for us to go in, much more comfortable for us to sit in a room, to read a book or to have a conversation or to watch TV or, um, or, or anything that we, we typically would do as we live in our homes. And so it's important to not just take a permit set. And I've seen homes of all levels have the most basic lighting um, placements and, and design of lights in a house. Um, that with a little bit of touch and a little bit of feel and a little bit of conversation, we can really go in and hone in on, on what's important and how a space is going to be lived in so that we get fixtures in the right position in order to make that a more welcoming and a more comfortable environment for our customers. It doesn't add a tremendous amount of cost, right? Um, but it, it certainly adds a lot of value and it certainly adds a lot of comfort into the space um, to be used. So, um, so you've got this lovely lighting design. Now you've got to do some lighting control. What, what does that mean? I mean, what, what should a homeowner be thinking you're going to do? I'd love to take this. <laughs> uh, so what happens is a lot of times as we look at a, a good lighting design, right? So now we've identified that in a room, let's take a bedroom this time, for example, we may have some reading lights over the bed. We may have... Uh, an art light for a piece of art or a piece of furniture or, you know, in the room. You may have some down lights in the room. You may have a hanging fixture for a decorative light in the space. Uh, we may have some lamp lighting in there that's controlled. And so all of a sudden we may have five or six loads of lighting in a space. And so one of the things that we want to do is we want to get rid of that clutter that happens, right? We don't want to have a, a six gang light switch that sits on the wall with all these different toggles and switches in it. We want to clean that up and make that go to a simple, elegant keypad that's very easy and intuitive to use. And so um, that's where control comes in. So where we've taken, you know, lighting design and lighting fixture layout, and we put this into an easy and simple to use format. And so that's where we put a, a system in, and maybe that's Lutron or Crestron or Control 4 or whatever solution is appropriate for the customer. But we put that in place, and then we go in and we start talking about what needs to be done in that space. And, you know, whether that's an a good night button as you're going to bed that shuts off the rest of the house or maybe an evening scene that goes in there and you hit an accent button that allows you to just comfortably sit in the room um, as you wind down for the evening. Um, and we can talk through what those scenarios look like and make sure that we tailor a solution specific to what the customer's needs are for that particular area. And I think a yeah. lot of people, they don't realize that they want lighting design because they've never heard of it or sorry, lighting control, they've never heard of it referred to as lighting control. But most people, when they get home in the evening, turn a few lamps on because they like the way that looks and they like the way that feels as opposed to their overhead light. Um, and that's kind of what lighting control is, right? It's being able to automatically or easily get that feel that you like every time you're in the house. Like in my personal house, we have a small lighting control system, but every time I come home in the evening, it's lit nicely, it's inviting and it's warm. And when we go to bed, the lights that are in the front of the house just turn off automatically after we go to sleep. And those are all things I think people would want and they work around, they just don't realize that there's a solution out there called lighting control. Right, I, I talk to clients all the time, if I can jump in about um, the dad walk, right? So anybody who has kids uh, or family, you know, you do the dad walk at night, make sure all the doors are locked, all the lights are turned off, TVs are shut down. Um, and so this eliminates that dad walk. Like Keith mentioned, you could have a good night button that sh shuts off the entire house if you want it to, or shuts off the entire house and leaves the port lights at you know, safety. Um, so it's an enhancement for that as well, but it eliminates that dad walk that, you know, w once you talk to a homeowner and say, hey, you never have to commit another dad walk because, you know, between the lighting control and the other smart technology we're putting in now, you hit that one button on a Lutron or, or, or Crestron control system and it locks your doors. It turns off your lights. It turns your cameras to, to different uh, settings uh, appropriate for, for an overnight um, experience. So, you know, once you talk to people about, you know, that, uh, that dad walk being eliminated, you know, people perk up, um, you know, people, all people have lighting control experience right now. It's usually, you know, whoever the homeowner is, right. They're just walking around and hitting lights like Keith said, you know, and, and you don't yeah, realize how much time or, invest. Or we're just leaving a couple lamps on when they go to work. So that when they come home, it's not dark in the house. Like that's medieval technology. That's just leaving a candle <laughs> burning. 
Like, we can do better. But but I want to ask you a question, because it's not obvious to me, or it wasn't when I first put some lighting control in. Not every light gets a switch. And typically when people build homes, every light has a switch, and that lamp that Keith talked about was on a switch that was plugged into the wall. But But you don't necessarily end up in this world with every light having a switch, do you? No, absolutely not. I think um, I think that's one of the biggest hurdles that people have to get past when you have gone from a world of having an individual switch for every single fixture that's in the house um, or every single circuit of light that's in the house and now going to a keypad that is more scene-based or control-based off of that. It's like, um, I always equate it to car technology, right? At, at one point, it was perfectly acceptable to reach across your car and to roll down a window. But once you got the ability to have an automatic window button to roll that window up and down, you could never imagine going back to it. And I think the same thing holds true for, for lighting, is that once you get used to this concept of how lighting controls can work within your home, it becomes very easy and very understanding on how that works. And so it's done more based off of space. At least we see this commonly done this way, where it's based off of the spaces you're walking into, um, the task or the things that are commonly um, done in that room. Um, like kitchen earlier, we talked about cooking or cleaning. Bedroom is a good night button or you know something like that or a welcome button as you come home or an away button when you leave the house and the last person out of the house that you're not shutting off all the lights or leaving lights on as you drive away. Um, having the home automatically light up for you in the evening so you're never coming home to um, a dark house. You're coming home to a safe home, a well-lit home. Um, and having the ability to have that. But it is a transition. It's a change in mindset of having the ability to say, I want that chandelier to be at 43%, and I want my down lights to be over here. We set that, and we configure that for you so that when you walk into that space and you hit the dining room button, that it's perfectly lit and very welcoming coming in so that you're not having to go to each of those switches. It actually saves you time, and it makes it easier to live in the home. And I think over time, what we've found when – clients communicate back to us after they've lived in their home for a little while and gotten used to it is that they they rarely interact as much with lighting as they did before they'll find less time Mm -hmm. hitting switches and adjusting lighting because we've already figured out their lifestyle and the way it works and be able to put that together for them so that it can go together in a simpler easier to use way that i actually really like your car analogy and it made me think of in my car i have the auto air conditioner button you know, and I, I don't care if the air is coming out of the vent in front of me or on the floor or if it's super hot air or whatever it is. I turn that auto to whatever temperature I want it to be. And then I trust that the car is going to make it that temperature for me. Right? Lighting control is kind of doing the same thing for us, right? It's allowing us to uh, to know what we want the room to do. And just having a button that makes the room do that thing, it's not a bunch of individual switches that I have to go through and hit each time most people are going to use the same lighting in their room every time they cook, right? They're going to use the same lighting in their room every evening in their master bedroom. It might just be the lamps on the bedside table dimmed way down. Most people don't really care if they have individual control of every one of those light sources. They just know what they want the room to look like at the end of the day. Now, one of the things that that I've noticed on some of the proposals I see is how expensive some of these fancy light bulbs are and why why is there any big difference between what we talk about in terms of a high quality LED and the one I can buy from Home Depot and put a you know put a little fader on what there's a big difference between low and quite quality LEDs isn't there Oh, it's, it's gigantic. You can spend, like you said, you can go get a, a basic light bulb, Home Depot LED light bulb for, you know, $10 and screw it in versus like a nice integrated LED that not only aesthetically looks better, um, but there's a couple of different things to consider with the actual light source. Uh, one is that a lot of people don't want to actually see the light source. Um, so the way it's actually installed into the space, especially if it's a new construction uh, you know, where the light fixture essentially dis- disappears. So it's just a well-lit room and you're not, you know, you don't have a tendency to look up to see what's lighting the room or there's no uh, violent glare. Like I'm sitting at a restaurant now and I had to turn around because there's so much glare coming from the light fixtures. Um, so it's not a 
a very nice looking uh, can, you know, light can. Um, but there's also the, the color that it reproduces. So there, there's something called CRI, uh, which is the color rendering index um, for those that are not familiar, but it's how well it, it produces. If I hold up a, a Granny Smith apple um, in the sunlight, you know, I want, I want it to look like that at my house as well. Um, you know, so how accurately it portrays color is really important uh, to your eye. Because uh, the LEDs in my apartment do not fade past about 15%. And is, is that something, one of those differences you were talking about, TJ? Yeah, so it, higher end LEDs will also dim down and, and they'll fade out versus, you know, the LEDs that you're describing, which go down about 15%, then they flick off, right? And it, it makes it look more like a light switch. Uh, when you're when you're fading it down, all of a sudden it just shuts off on you. So um, that's another control feature of a of a better LED fixture is that it'll dim down to you know down to one percent or even less, um, so that it truly looks like it fades out. And the comparison I usually use is when you go to a to a nice movie theater and they're about to start the movie, um, those lights never just shut off or they never go down to a certain percentage and and, and you never notice them, right? It, it slowly fades and it creates that. Um, uh, I don't know, it, it builds the um, attention. Sorry. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it gets you ready. It gets it gets prepared. You know, you, those lights dim dim down. You know, the movie's about to start and uh, creates that environment for you. So yeah, the, the uh, how they dim is also another important feature when you're looking at lighting fixtures. Yeah, I think that it's really important to acknowledge that LEDs are completely different than what we've been used to. And I say that now, I guess we probably are more used to LED today than we are or than we had been in the past five years ago, for example. Um, but what we find is that you know, our reference point for lighting has been an incandescent or a halogen bulb for the last 50 years of our lives, right? Um, and so we got used to how they performed. And so um, the way they were built is they had a filament that went in the bulb and as electricity passed through that filament, it got hot and it created light that came out of it. And so it was easier for us to control the intensity or the brightness of that light um, by having a dimmer on that. Uh, but that worked differently when it came to LED. Instead of, um, and, and really that starts with how we dim light. It's not, like a, it's not like a water pipe, right? So we're not reducing the amount of water flow that goes through things. Um, when you dim a light, you're actually turning it on and off um, really fast or very slow um, to eliminate the amount of electricity that goes through it. And that then is less intensity in that filament, less light that comes out of it, and therefore a dimmer feel, right? When we go to LED, that's being driven by a microchip. There's a, a diode on that, and that's what illuminates the light that comes out of it. Well, when you pump electricity, when you stop it or start it and it doesn't work the same for a computer chip as it did for a filament. And so it's a completely different philosophy on how that works. And so when we talk about performance, and as TJ had mentioned, when we talk about fading off light or being able to dim it down lower, um, it works in a different way. And so the better bulbs have a more accurate uh, feel for how that dims when we start at 100% and it dims down to 1% or 5% or 0, wherever we can get to, that rating Will determine how far it can dim will have a lot of effect on cost um, and then the performance of what that light looks like as it goes down um, whether we want that to go from you know a very white or a blue light or a warm light into a more candlelight kind of feel too that can be a different experience as well on how that looks and so there's a lot of factors that go into that uh, on how that works and some of them are just in retrofit bulbs that fit into existing fixtures because we have a lot of existing homes that do it that way and then in new construction, we can actually have those where they're all integrated together and we get far better performance out of fixtures that have those LEDs already built into it, where you're not actually putting a bulb inside of it, where it's all built together and made to function as a solution, as opposed to taking an old can, an old light in the ceiling and putting a bulb into it to make it work. Um, but those are absolutely factors on how that works. And then you take a ceiling and maybe you have four lights or six lights or eight lights in the ceiling and we want them all to look the same. And so when you put a bulb in, there's something called binning, which is how accurate all the different lights are created. So when you buy a Philips bulb or whatever brand, a Sora bulb, whatever you're putting in, we want them all to look the same over time. And as lighting changes or as time changes, that they all fade and keep a similar look to it. You don't want one light to have a more yellow feel to it than a 
a bluer light and another fixture over here because your ceiling will feel very odd and very weird and the light in the space will feel strange that way as well. And so there's a lot of factors that go into it. And that's one of the best reasons why you want to work with Robis or with a, a professional that can help you make sure that you address all these things that those aren't afterthoughts, but they're planned ahead of time so that all that goes together. I want to just define the binning thing because I come from a manufacturing background. So let's make sure I caught that correctly. So you're in Home Depot, you're in wherever it is. There are two light bulbs next to each other on the shelf. There's no way you know whether they were actually manufactured at the same time, in the same place, with the same parts... I mean, they could be completely different specs in the same box. How does a more sophisticated lighting system, as you described it, solve a problem like that? Yeah, and that's really what it comes down to. As we look at how light is, how color is, is made out of a light, there's something called a, a McAdams ellipse. And so that's how this spectrum of light goes out and how we measure different colors. Like, for example, the sun uh, during the middle of the day is a more blue, whiter color early in the morning, and then it fades to a more yellow or more amber feel in the evening time. And so that's how color changes. So when they're creating these bulbs, right, oftentimes made in many different factories, as you just mentioned, um, the ability to have um, a, a rating system or a way that they can say that is something called binning. And so that's being able to hone in on this color spectrum and this manufacturing spectrum to get into a very small dot on this whole chart that says these are going to look exactly like what this is. And that's why you can feel confident that this fixture, whether it was made in that factory or this one over here, is going to abide by this standard or this quality of light that goes through it. And that's ultimately what binning is and how we're able to look at that. Now, when you look at the box uh, on the shelf in a Home Depot, um, you're probably not going to see that there. You're going to see that it says this is a 2700 Kelvin light and it is going to be 60 watt equivalent to brightness that comes out of it. That's what you're going to get um, uh, because that's the, the easy way to make a product that fits a price point that works well that way. Um, but when you work with um, a lighting designer, a technology company like Bravis, um, or even a lighting store, you're going to be able to find better products, oftentimes that not any more money, uh, but that really abide by those uh, standards and understand what you're looking at in order to get that. Um, and so that you'll find that every product like that is built with a spec sheet, and so we'll have those available to be able to show you what it is and to ensure that we're giving you a proven solution uh, before it's ever built or put in. Okay, so who can do off the back of their heads the different lighting temperatures so we you know at the top is like bright sunlight how many kelvin is that sunlight would be probably about 5000 kelvin just depending on where in the country you live <laughs> okay so let's go down the list and uh, I think we've lost Keith, but he'll dial back in. Uh, what's below sunlight? So let's see how good you are at the numbers. Okay. Um, yeah, so we, we start in a residence. You, usually 2700 is about as low as we specify as far as color temperature. It's a very orange light. Um, less popular amongst modern homes, more traditional. Uh, you have 3000, which I'd probably reckon to say is the most common in a residential space. Um, from there, you go to 3,500, 4,000, then 5,000. And, and 4,000 and 5,000 typically we're specifying for commercial spaces. I, I've only done one residence that had a, a color temperature that's that high. And, that, and it's a very white or, or almost blue light at that point. Yeah. So I think that the spectrum really goes from kind of the brightest light, you know, the 6,000 Kelvin, 5,000 Kelvin of early morning sunlight as it comes out. Um, all the way down to like candlelight, which is considered about 1400 Kelvin. So you can envision kind of that warmer amber glow to it. And as TJ had mentioned, um, most commonly in residential side of things is you're somewhere in the, the 2700 Kelvin to maybe 3300 Kelvin range is what we see traditionally for inside homes. Um, more traditional, um, more standard fields we think are like the warmer colors, which is the smaller number. So like 2700 Kelvin would be uh, very traditional lighting, uh, something that we've seen often. Uh, more modern, more contemporary homes typically fall into like the 3,000 Kelvin or possibly even like 3,300 Kelvin range as far as light. Um, and that's more of a wider, 
um, light, not as much amber or yellow or orange built into it. Um, it kind of goes that way off of it. And so that's a lot of times what we see there. As you go beyond that, it, it, as you move up from that, um, there are properties that happen as we get bluer lights, or which is a reference blue light is more of this five to 600 Kelvin range. Um, that naturally makes us more awake. Our bodies are more alert. Um, one of the things uh, that happens, so, so that's what happens when we wake up in the morning is we have blue light. That's what the sunlight kind of comes out with, and that helps us kind of wake up for the day, be more alert, um, help us get ready to go for the day. And as the day progresses throughout the day, it goes to this warmer amber light or this kind of yellowish orange light, and that would be more of the evening or to get us to kind of fall asleep. Um, if you have an iPhone or any kind of like high-tech cell phone, um, you'll notice that they have different things that are built into it where it removes the blue light in the evening time. And they do that so that as we look at our phones and we're checking our email before we go to bed, that that blue light doesn't keep us awake. It doesn't create a distraction for us. It allows us to get um, more tired and more, um, more, more, well, more ready for rest, I guess, as I should say. So um, that's what we talk about when we have the spectrum of light as it goes through it. And there are technologies now, um, Ketra being one of them, Savant has some great products through USAI, uh, where there's light that actually inside your home that will actually change and mimic what's happening with the sun throughout the day so that you get that natural circadian rhythm or that lighting changing to be accurate with what's happening outside. Um, and that's healthy for our bodies. So you just brought up uh, what sometimes called human centric or uh, circadian rhythms. Uh, TJ, how hard is this to sell to a customer? Are people buying these ideas or is this, uh, you know, black magic to people? Yeah, I would, I would say people buying right now are still early adopters uh, you know, in the technology. It's it's relatively new or at least relatively new to us on a consumer level. Um so yeah, it's not being specified every day, but we do have people that are that are purchasing the, the projects that we do have. Uh, they have circadian rhythm lighting, or, or you know that sophisticated level of lighting that they're beautiful and the clients love them. Um, and as Kevin mentioned, it, it's it's very healthy. It, it's the way that we were kind of built to live. You know, we know when the sun is up, we're supposed to be awake, and the sun's coming down, and you know, becoming more orange. That's the time we're supposed to go to sleep so having that benefit with your fixtures that that are very accurate and can reproduce that light without you telling it to uh, is extremely beneficial um but it's still you know people like i said it's it's early adopters at this point who are into the technology and we were talking about it um that's usually a starting point for us you know we, we talk people about it see if they're interested and then uh, we can get into other factors uh if, if that's not the right solution for them yeah, if nothing else, it educates them on just kind of the value of thinking about your home lighting and how that's going to affect your health. Um, you know, for most of our clients, if that's not something they can afford, they may still want to do something like a dim to warm fixture where in the evenings, as we're dimming the light down, it's also getting that nice warm amber glow. Um, and that's going to give them some of the basic benefits of that circadian rhythm lighting just on more of a a budget with a little bit less control. Um, but at least now we've started to have those conversations. They can understand the importance of it and make a decision for themselves. So, you know, I've got lighting. I can dim to warm. I can do circadian. I assume the circadian is, an, is it a programming thing or is it something these sophisticated lighting systems doing at home? How, how would you actually do that if you were, if you're doing it for a client? Yeah, so it's there. Most of the the systems, both with Savant, with Crestron, even, and with Lutron, and all the different products that are on the market, um, part of the evolution that's made this kind of come out now and be a more mainstream solution for people is the fact that they have now made that an easier, uh, repeatable system that goes in. Right in the past, it was something where you had to have this brilliant programmer who could set all that stuff up for you, um, and now it's it's baked into um, these systems so that it comes out the right way. And so it's not a, an overly complex issue anymore. Uh, the products themselves certainly are more expensive, um, but that's changing and evolving as we move. Um, and while it may be early in adoption for the majority of people um, who are putting these things in, um, this will become a mainstream technology that 
that we will all live with um, at some point in the next you know five or, or seven years. And so I think it's important to understand that, especially as we deal with people who are building homes that may only be in the design phase today, uh, but may you know have a two year life cycle or a year life cycle of construction and another six months or nine months before it actually breaks ground. Um, there's a you know it's an important and a responsibility to be able to educate people on what's available to them so they can make that decision. Now I can do more than just circadian. I can also do something, and I know different manufacturers describe it differently, uh, but saturation or, you know, so what, what is that and how should I use it? Yeah, T- TJ mentioned CRI earlier, you know, just the quality of the light, but the highest quality of light or the most accurate light isn't necessarily the most attractive light in every space. So that ability to tune the lighting to look exactly how you want it to look is kind of what he's talking about. So you could have every light in your house be nice and warm and provide that comforting glow in the evening, but a light that's aiming at a piece of artwork, uh, you could have that adjusted so that it makes that art look exactly the way you want it to look, or even maybe the way it was painted. Like if it was painted outdoors, you could have it lit with traditional sunlight lighting, or if it was painted in somebody's studio by candlelight, you could have it lit so that it looked like that. Um, so it's just that adjustability to make the lighting do exactly what you want it to at any time. Um, and that can all be done on the programming side. Like Kevin said, the circadian rhythm, if that's what a client wants, it'll just do that automatically throughout the day all the time. Um, but we can easily program the lighting to literally be whatever a client wants, even if it's something crazy like purple lighting in their kid's playroom or something like that, we can do that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think the thing about this adjustable lighting, right, is not the fact that you're always mimicking the sunlight, but that there are practical applications for this. You know, but just personally speaking, I have twins um, that are 10 years old that are in school, and you know, I work all day. I get home, and uh, I have dinner with the family. I hang out with them for a little bit, and I put them to bed, and then I might have another hour, hour and a half of work that needs to get done, but I'm worn out by the end of the day. But I can go into my office. I can adjust the light to be a more blue and more awake or aware light. Um, and that helps me be more productive as I sit down to knock out my last hour of work or, you know, answer those handful of emails or, you know, design work and stuff that needs to be done. And so, you know, it's a very practical application for what that is. And at the same time, if we wanted to do something fun for a birthday party or, you know, um, St. Patty's Day get together or something like that, you can make those lights change and mimic a color specific to uh, that event or to make it look fun that way. And so, um, there are obviously very kind of feature fun things that go to it, but also very practical things that work on and help you kind of um, live your lifestyle that way. So purple bedrooms. I saw one demo house. I think it was the Savant uh, house in New York where they had like chill party mode. And that that someone explained what that was that I was looking at. Anybody know? Don't ask me. I don't have parties. Well, in a non-COVID world, (laughs) post-COVID pandemic, um, you can sort of change the whole house with a scene that way, using different colors, can't you? Right. And I can't speak to the the party mode necessarily. Um, And I think Keith was referring to the fact that he has a newborn baby. So there's no parties going on at his house at the moment. Um, And especially with COVID. But anyway... uh, you know, something that the clients do that, that have this type of lighting technology, uh, as an example, it's pretty common is um, having blue light uh, overnight so that if they have to like wake up to go to the kitchen or go to the restroom, the blue light actually doesn't penetrate your eyelid when you're sleeping. And so you can have your lights automatically turn blue if they're activated between certain hours of the day, say, you know, 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. or something like that. So that if you do need to get up to go, you know, do something around the house, check on the kids, go to the kitchen to get a glass of water, go to the restroom, et cetera, you're not completely waking up, um, you know, people, other people in the space, um, such as a spouse or kids, uh, but you're also not waking yourself fully up. Uh, so when you get back to bed, you can actually fall back asleep versus a, a very bright light. Um, so I, I think that hopefully answers your question about the party mode too. It'd be the same t- idea. You hit party mode and you can have it, you know, do strobing colors or purple yeah. or you know whatever 
pickles your fancy. <laughs> I think I think they meant this to be chill out rather than party mode, which is you know you have friends round, you hit the button, the lights go down. There's you use different colors in different rooms, and it activates the music. And it 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 was just fascinating because most scenes seem to be about. You know, the scenes we use most are good night, no way. So good night turns off, you know, all the lights except the bedroom lights. Away shuts everything down and actually closes the shades and stuff and, and sort of minimizes the power going into the home. But but I love the idea that at a press of a button, you can change the whole feeling in the home through color, through accents, through you know, different approaches to how you mix with the accent, the task, the ambient, and all the different lights you've designed in. Well, and one of the Absolutely. fun things about that is the only ways we control it don't have to be keypads or tablets. I mean, you can have it automatic. So if you have lighting control in a theater, when you hit play and you're on your DVD player, Blu-ray player, something like that, and you're watching a movie, you could hit play and have the lights automatically dim and have them come back up slightly when you pause it. Um, or you could have a motion sensor in your bathroom so that when you walk into the bathroom or get out of bed in the middle of the night, the lights come on very, very dim so you can get to the, get to the toilet and back without tripping over something. And there's just so many ways to integrate it into the house. You know, it's not just buttons on the wall anymore. Like there's just so many neat ways to integrate that into someone's lifestyle. And yeah, and if I can give a real life that, example, Go for it, TJ. Okay. Sorry, Kevin. Um, a real life example, I have a client who lives in Dallas that has uh, triplets. And so, you know, they're, they're older. They're not, they're not newborn or anything like that anymore. They're in uh, middle school, but um, they have a programming uh, feature on their system, on their integration system, so that when they're up late watching a movie, her and her husband and the kids are already asleep, uh, they hit the movie night mode just on their handheld remote, you know, their TV remote. And that actually prompts uh, white noise in the hallway uh, that's outside of the girls' rooms. So they don't hear the movie. It doesn't wake them up. And it also dims the lights. It, it gets the scene completely set up for them to watch a movie. It sets the volume preset to what they wanted it to be. Um, but then it closes the shades, which is another form of lighting control we haven't really touched on at all. Um, but it closes their automated shades. It dims their lights the way that they like to watch movies. Um, but it's very cool. It's at a press of a button. They don't have to have their phone on them. Um, so I think it's important, like what Keith mentioned, a lot of people, when they get home from work or you know, have had a stressful day, they don't want to be staring at their device anymore. Um, so I have a lot of clients ask me, do I have to have my phone on me to do this? Um, and the answer is no. There's lots of different ways to do it, either via voice control um, or the handheld remotes, uh, keypads on the wall, where you can disconnect but still control your home and have, have all the benefits of a smart home. Yeah, that's right. And I think, too, you know, it's, it's not just and I know we're talking specific about lighting on this podcast, but it's not just limited to, to lighting. Right. As you, um, Nigel, as you mentioned about, like, how you can kind of set the mode for a house or, um, you know, a feel for the home on how you want things to be done. And it's about tying in things like lighting and music together or um, you know, even heating and cooling to, to be a part of that. That all helps create that feel and, um, and comfort of the home. And so. Um, that's simply an extension of, and as TJ had mentioned, you know, making sure that when we talk about lighting control, we're not just talking about, uh, you know, the lights within the house. We're talking about managing the light that comes from outside the house, the privacy that comes from that, you know, the ability to um, have a, go to bed at night and have your shades in your bedroom go down and be blackout so that you're not, um, the exterior lights that are on for safety aren't bleeding into your room and creating more light in the space where, um, where you want to sleep. And so it kind of touches all of those points and how that works. Okay, so you just talked a lot about indoors and using this great technology for indoors. Uh, does this also apply to outdoors or is, is outdoors completely different? No, it all really does apply to outdoors as well. Um, lighting design outdoors, good landscape lighting is gonna make a space feel a lot more comfortable even from inside the house. When you're looking outside the windows and you can see your yard, uh, that gives a sense of privacy and safety. Um, and then the same control techniques apply. Absolutely. We can still have the lights come on in the evening, go off. Um, we can even have things happen. Like if your security alarm were activated, 
have the lights flash in the front yard so that the police know how to get to your house. I mean, there's a lot of things that can be done um, outside the home. And honestly, most people, the first thing they want to control is their exterior lights um, because that's just something that they're frustrated with typically when they don't have a lighting control system. Okay. Uh, Anyone else? Any good outdoor lighting experiences? I think it's an extension of the home. Um, Nowadays, with architecture and design, it really is kind of this inside-outside flow, especially um, with how things are done, specifically here in Houston, right? Where we can be outside all the time. Uh, So it's it's absolutely an extension of what we do inside the home needs to be replicated outside of the home, Um, and it's a natural fit for that to happen. And so. As Keith had mentioned, maybe it's highlighting a putting green out in the backyard or a bocce ball court or just the ability to know that the backyard is well lit and that you're able to see out and you're not just looking into this you know, void of darkness that goes outside. That, that's a very comforting, very safe feeling that goes along with that. Um, it's also very usable. You've now extended the amount of space that you can live in and the time of day you can use it and to being able to have that lit for enjoyment in the evening time. So um, a very important piece of that as well having your, your outdoor lighting be a part of the lighting system, mm-hmm. the control of lighting, and the design of what you put together. So um, a question that I guess both really for for you guys who are in sales, so more, um, well, in fact, all three of you are sort of in sales. Um, why can't my electrician do this? Well, you know, you guys are Bravis, you, you look great, you're very smart. Uh, you charge a lot of money. Why can't my electrician, who's going to wire all my high voltage, do this? What's what's the answer about why why someone like Bravis or or Bravis in this story? Um, I mean, Bravis, we're we're very focused on design. Um, electricians, most I won't speak for every electrician. There's some great electricians out there, so I want to insult an entire um, you know uh, field, but. You know, we're focused on design and making it very um, functional in the space, making it look good in the space. Where most electricians that I've had interactions with are just, hey, give me a blueprint, how to install it. I'm going to install it, do it quickly, and then move on to my next project, make sure I get my permits, and, and I'm good to go. Uh, the majority of electricians don't take the time to learn how to properly design light. Uh, like Keith mentioned earlier, four cans and a fan, they think, okay, it's a well-lit space. I'm going to pass my permitting, and I'm good to go. Um, but the thoughtfulness and the time that goes into the design, it's, it's hours and hours and hours. It's not a quick, uh, quick fix process or anything like that. I think there's also a vertical integration aspect to it, which is if we're going to be controlling the light, then we should also be providing the light that we're controlling just to make sure that the client's getting a seamless system that works exactly the way we said it was going to work. Yeah, and I think that you have to look, too, at the differences between an electrical contracting company and an integration firm or technology firm like ourselves is that, you know, they're coming from, I've got to make sure that I've got power from an electrical pole to the house. They're dealing with load calculations as far as how much power do they need for the home. They're talking about electrical circuiting for outlets. They have a different mindset on how that works. And they're typically, um, their involvement is, during the the rough in phase and then at the trim phase and then oftentimes they're gone versus a company like ours that's involved much earlier in the process preferably um, all the way through the completion of all the work and then we are there to handhold and service our clients long after the fact and so um, we're involved with them as technology changes right as internet upgrades happen and as um, you know parents come to live in the home as they get older or a new baby's born or um, what, whatever happens from a lifestyle perspective changes. We, we are there as a technology partner with them throughout the lifespan of that house and the, and the home. And so naturally it fits better for us to be involved with that. And not to mention the more technical and programming skill, not necessarily just the, the, the rough in and the electrical contracting work that happens. There's a lot more, there's obviously that side of it, but then there's also the side of, of programming. And sometimes that takes more knowledge. And I know speaking for Bravis and on our behalf, Certainly we do a lot more training, a lot more education. We've got more certifications um, where we've done this for so many people and we've been doing this for, for a far longer amount of time uh, than electricians have been doing this. So that helps um, make, you know, bring more ease and comfort for clients as they get settled into their house by having it done right. 
So what are the questions are people asking you about light? Are there things in the last sort of 50 minutes we haven't talked about that uh, when you think about your clients, your customers, the trade partners you work with that they're asking about? No, I don't know if this is the right form or if we want to get into this, but we haven't talked about natural light and how that impacts the house at all and, and automated shade technology. I don't know if that's for another another podcast or if that you know we can address that at all well i think i don't want to go down the whole shades because i think there's another hour of conversations to have about (laughs) about shades but i think the point is a good one isn't it that that uh there's a whole bunch of light outside and getting that mix right is another design decision absolutely yeah, it's huge. And then how those integrate together, you know, with the right system, um, you know, the, the lighting controls will be aware of, of the natural sunlight and, and where it's hitting in the house and adjust the lighting accordingly um, using what's called conditional logic. Um, so it, it knows the, you know, where the sun's at, what season it is, uh, when the sunset is. Um, so it, it manages your shades appropriately and then the lighting, uh, you know, to, um, to be the, the yin and yang, right, for each space. Kevin, anything else people ask you about lighting we haven't covered? You know, the conversation always starts generally with dimming. You know, how do we make sure that we have the performance of what we're used to having in previous homes? And so I think it's important to acknowledge the fact that the majority of what we've talked about in this is not something that people are bringing to us. It's stuff that we have a responsibility to educate them on and allow them to know what's available to them. Uh, But really, um, you know, Talk about the performance of what's happening with it. Talk, let them know what's available and, you know, give them guidance on whether they're buying the fixtures from us or from anybody. They're buying a quality product that goes in and it's going to be made for the next 10 or 15 years, 20 years of the home um, so that they don't have maintenance issues and stuff that go along with it. And I think that all of those really kind of bring that experience full circle for them. Uh, and then really, you know, understanding who our clients are and who and who we're working with and making sure that we're providing a solution that adds value to their home and into their lifestyle. And, um, and, and looking at it from that perspective, I think is a really important piece. And I think probably one of the things that Bravis as a whole does very well. And Keith, you work with a lot of designers like the other guys do and architects. We can help with education and stuff like that for them too, can't we? Yeah, absolutely. We can provide education for them so that they can talk to their clients. Um, And then we can also be a resource. Um, It's not uncommon for a client to mention lighting control or motorized shades, um, or sorry, one of our specifiers to mention it to a client. And when the client kind of gives them a blank stare, they just say, well, let me bring uh, Bravis in and they'll kind of explain it to you so you know what your options are. Um, and we love doing that because, as Kevin said, it is about being able to educate people on something they probably haven't experienced and they don't necessarily know why they need. Um, but once someone has lived with motorized shades and a well-designed lighting control system, they're not going back. So I thought we would end with everybody trying to describe their best lighting job. And I'll, I'll give you a moment to think about it, but I'll tell you, the first lighting job I did was, um, I saw, was uh, actually a home in Dallas that we had done. And it was the lady's closet, you know, her dressing room that completely blew me away. And uh, James, one of our team members that took me around it, said, you need to understand there's not light here, there's five layers of light. And he turned off all the lights and he turned them on individually and it was like you know a a museum quality piece of lighting and he said look this this customer has gucci handbags and all the sorts of you know fancy shoes she wants to see the colors she wants to see the experience and and to be honest with you it was the first time i'd ever seen light in a home completely blow me away and become less of utility and more of a differentiator for that room so that was mine first keith do you have a an experience like that i know the quality of jobs that these other two guys do so i'm just going to defer to them and give them more time okay guys uh wow job what what does what do you think of 
I, I have one specific example of a thing that just, it, even as long as I've done this, it just blew my mind. Uh, we had a client who had this piece of artwork and um, it was this large round diameter piece of artwork uh, that had like little projection things that came out with different colors that changed as it went deep within this piece of art. It was amazing. And so we lit that and we actually had the ability to, to saturate the, the artwork that came off of it. And the client walked in and literally started crying because of how amazing and how different that piece of art looked in the new location versus how it looked in their old home. Um, and it, it just took lighting it correctly in order to make, um, to make it feel that way. Right. And it was, um, and it changed something that, I mean, this wasn't a priceless work of art. This was a, a $20,000, you know, $10,000 piece. I, I have no idea. It was an expensive piece of artwork, but it made it so much better than what she'd ever experienced it looking at. Um, and I think that that's something that you can do. And with the right knowledge, taking the time to do it right and really understanding what a client's looking for and designing it from the beginning so that they get what they expected out of it. They're going to spend a lot of money on surfaces and floors and furnishings. We might as well make them look the best they possibly can look. TJ, do you have yeah. one? Yeah. I mean, I, I have a, I have a few, one, one that we just recently did was we, we lit up a wine bar uh, with multiple layers of light and kind of the same thing where you can see the colors of the bottles pop um, and create that really cool bar atmosphere in a home. Um, but felt like a luxury bar in Vegas, right? And it was a really, really cool looking feel, but the kind of aha moment for me with lighting um, was my first project was, which is actually, was a retrofit. We retrofit some, some really nice um, integrated LEDs and the, the before and after um, with how the, the home, the entire environment of the home just changed and the homeowner's reaction to it, um, who is also kind of skeptical about, you know, they're like, hey, light bulb's a light bulb. That was kind of the beginning of our conversation. Ended up swapping out every almost every single light in the entire house with an integrated LED that had high CRI that was, you know, that dimmed really well and putting a lighting control system and just the way it changed their opinion of the way their house looked and felt uh, was really cool and you know felt like we really uh, enhanced that you know homeowners experience and, and life well listen i think it's been a great conversation i suspect light someone used the example of a wind down window in the car earlier i think maybe kevin uh, i'm guessing if we go forward a few years this conversation about lighting is going to be like a wind down window. How did we ever survive, you know, before good lighting design, good control, you know, color render index and all the rest of that stuff. So I'm uh, grateful for the time. I think it was a great session. And uh, on behalf of the team, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you.